Hello, I'm Jack Titchener, and welcome to Illinois Lawmakers' weekly coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly. Our leadoff guest is Rich Miller of CapitalFacts.com. Rich, good to have you on the program again, sir. Good to be here. It's very good um, to be here. Big news, uh, we're taping this on uh, Thursday. Uh, big news overnight was that the Illinois House uh, passed legislation to partially offset the state's $4.5 billion unemployment insurance fund debt. Uh, it was pretty much on a, a party line vote. It was on a party line vote. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, these things are produced by an agreed bill process. It has been since Jim Thompson was governor any changes to workers' comp or, you know, uh, or unemployment insurance. Um, and that process has broken down, but the state is facing a, a, a March 31st deadline to uh, pay down uh, some of its debt using ARPA funds. And so the House, uh, the American Rescue Program uh, funds, uh, and the House voted yesterday to spend $2.7 billion out of the remaining uh, ARPA funds. And that's well, uh, at 1.8 billion short. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, exactly. They've spent some money on capital projects. They spent some money, you know, on the stuff they were supposed to spend it on. Um, but uh, they didn't leave enough in the account to pay off that debt. So now it's going to have to be paid uh, uh, one of three ways or a combination of three ways, uh, which is tax hikes on employers. Um, benefit cuts for unemployed people and um, borrowing. I talked with uh, the uh, Deputy House Republican Leader Tom Demmer yesterday ahead of uh, that vote overnight uh, for uh, the insurance uh, uh, fund. He said, unemployment insurance fund, he said he was concerned that anything less than paying off the full amount was going to result in higher taxes for businesses and cutting unemployment benefits for those who need them the most. Um, he's not wrong. When that will happen, I don't know. Um, this looked like a punt yesterday. They may come back in the veto session after the election and try to do something then. Um, I, uh, it, there, the governor had ex been expressing hope for you know a year or more that the federal government would step in and help out with some more money to pay off this trust fund debt, uh, unemployment insurance debt of four and a half billion dollars. Mm -hmm. It just didn't happen. Like we gave you over eight billion, you know, right? Use some of that, uh, and so they did. Uh, the state has actually spent more, uh, a higher percentage of its ARPA dollars on on this than most other states have. But then again, we had a pretty darn large deficit as well. So this is kind of like uh, I can draw a corollary to. Um, the state's uh, pension funds. This is going to be something that grinds along for quite a while in the future, right? Uh, not quite as bad as that. I mean, you know, hundred billion dollars with the versus a couple billion dollars. Um, but it will take a while to pay off. Yeah, if they want to keep the 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 tax rates lower uh, and the benefits higher, then you know, borrowing to do that uh, and then minor adjustments. Uh, both ways um, is probably in the future there. There's some there's some breaking news as we uh, sit down to talk today uh, with the Illinois Supreme Court ruling about how uh, campaign funds could be used for criminal defense. Yeah, uh, Chicago Alderman uh, uh, sued and saying, you know, his predecessor was using uh, his campaign funds uh, for legal fees. Um, and uh, that made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, they ruled uh, today, Thursday, um, that you, can't, you can continue using your campaign funds uh, for lawyers. Uh, I mean, it's in the law that you can use it for legal expenses. So um, they weren't going to go beyond the law, I guess. And although I think was, this has happened in other states, I haven't had a chance to fully read that opinion yet, but um, they didn't go beyond existing state law. They said, if the General Assembly wants to prohibit it, they can't. Rich Miller, thank you so much for uh, your expertise and your time here on Illinois Lawmakers. 
Thanks for having me, Jack. Deputy House Republican Leader Tom Denver of Dixon joins us now on Illinois Lawmakers. Good to have you back on the program, sir. I'm glad to be here, Jack. Thanks. Uh, we're, we're counting down the days before the scheduled end of the session on April 8th. Where do things stand with the, the budget and the other big issues that still need to be addressed before lawmakers go home? Well, I, I think we have a ways to go. Um, as you know, a lot of times those uh, major issues kind of come together in the final week or so of session. Uh, so while time is, is ticking away, um, you know, here we are at late March and we still have uh, several weeks of session left. So I think um, progress on many of the bigger issues is, uh, is still in front of us. Um, we have on the budget side, we have completed in the House through our appropriations committees, uh, at least the first round review of the governor's proposed budget. We bring in all the agency directors, the department heads, and each talk about their budget proposal. Um, but of course, the General Assembly is where the budget is made. Uh, the governor's budget is only a proposal. It's a starting point. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we've heard that proposal, asked some questions about it. And now uh, members of both parties are starting to think about where, uh, as legislators, our budget priorities might be. You've always been one of the top uh, Republican budgeteers, uh, the folks behind the scenes who are actually going into the budget, going line by line, literally, uh, to uh, try to balance things out. Uh, how are House Republican uh, ideas being uh, represented in the budget as we speak? Well, we're really pushing uh, for attention on um, some of the one-time revenue sources that the state has had both in the current budget year and the upcoming budget year, um, and trying to make sure that we're not going to grow state spending uh, on a permanent basis because of one-time revenues. Um, and so, you know, folks have probably heard some of the attention that's been given uh, from the federal government. We've had billions of dollars come to the state through COVID relief efforts. Things like the American uh, Recovery Plan Act or ARPA as we call it, previously the CARES Act that, that uh, passed along quite a bit of money. Um, those are those have made for some very unusual state budgets. You know, we had these unpredictable swings one direction or another, or a huge influx of one-time revenues. We have to be very careful not to grow our structural spending. Uh, and, you know, it might look good in one year because we have some of these one-time revenues. We don't want to set ourselves up for a cliff in a future year when those one-time revenues are gone. Uh, you and House uh, Republican leader Jim Durkin co-wrote uh, a letter to Governor Pritzker earlier this week asking that the state commit what's left of the federal COVID funds uh, to be targeted towards the state's unemployment insurance trust fund. Why is this such a, a big issue? Uh, what's at stake here? This issue with the unemployment insurance trust fund is uh, will touch every single employee in the entire state of Illinois. Everybody who works and earns a paycheck is going to be impacted by this. Um, and anybody who files an unemployment claim would be impacted by this. This is a, a really significant issue, one that we've been trying to call attention to for over a year. The unemployment insurance trust fund, which is what pays out benefits to people on unemployment, uh, understandably took a huge hit when the, the stay at home order was in place, businesses were forced to shut down. We jumped to the highest level of unemployment in state history, and that quickly depleted the reserves that were had been built up in the trust fund. And we went into debt. We're today nearly $5 billion in debt in our unemployment insurance trust fund. That is doing a couple of things. First, it's costing us interest. Every single day that we're in debt, we're accruing more and more interest penalties. But second, uh, we stand to, if we don't use the resources we have to pay off this debt, we will have a massive tax increase on employers and a massive benefit cut for every single employee who files an unemployment claim. That's the only way to close the gap unless we come in and use some of our COVID relief dollars we got from the federal government to take care of the problem. And so our, our proposal that, uh, that Leader Durkin and I put, put forward is very simple. It says the federal government gave us one-time COVID relief dollars. We have a one-time COVID-caused problem in our unemployment insurance trust fund. There is no more natural connection than to use those dollars to take care of that problem and avoid a tax increase and avoid a benefit cut. As you were saying, uh, the debt now is somewhere around four and a half to five billion dollars in the uh, in the fund. Um, how much is actually left on the 
ARPA, uh, ARPA uh, funds balance, uh, we got something like $8 billion in, and I'm reading from uh, the governor's uh, staff that we're somewhere around $3.5 billion left. Well, I think it's important to know, you know, first, we looked at both the funding we received from the CARES Act in the first round and ARPA in the second round. Um, and that was nearly $13 billion that we received through those two groups. Um, it's important to know, too, that the figure that's been cited of $3.5 billion left is simply $3.5 billion that has not yet been appropriated. But more than that has not been spent. And so we're uh, calling for some of the money that's not been spent yet to be repurposed towards this fund. I think it should be a priority uh, of the state to not have uh, a tax increase on every job in the state and a benefit cut for every uh, unemployed worker in the state. And so we're calling for some of the dollars that have not been spent to be redirected to take care of this debt. So so where do things uh, stand today? Uh, you were saying earlier that uh, a lot of the budget has actually kind of uh, worked its way uh, down in terms of the negotiations and all. Um, Democrats have their priorities as well. Um, what kind of a hearing are you getting from the other side of the aisle on this particular issue? Well, you know, we've been uh, in talks on uh, the budget for uh, the last several um, weeks. As I talked about, we went through all these appropriations committees. Uh, we've had some um, discussions at a smaller group level with House Democrats about the budget, where things stand right now. But we really think it's important that we engage more lawmakers in this process. One of the criticisms we've had of the state budget uh, making in recent years has been um, how little transparency there is in the process. You know, last year, the budget was introduced at 1150 p.m. and voted on, you know, just before midnight on the last day of session. That's not fair to lawmakers. That's not fair to the public. So we're calling for more transparency and more engagement of every legislator in uh, the House of Representatives in this process. And uh, so far, the House Democrats have been a little hesitant to embrace those calls. Um, there was a really interesting article earlier this week in Crane's uh, Chicago Business that uh, Democratic members of Congress are urging Governor Pritzker to focus their spending priorities on such things as racial equity, climate change, and maintaining existing roads instead of uh, building new ones and doing more infrastructure. Um, how is that playing itself out as you read it from your side of the aisle? Well, you know, I think the infrastructure question is a little separate from the state's normal operating budget. Um, you know, we pay for those through uh, the road fund, which is separate than our general revenue fund. Um, it's also, you know, much of the infrastructure investment was the result of uh, a bipartisan capital bill that passed a few years ago. Um, and so, you know, many of those decisions and a lot of a lot of the road building decisions uh, are made as part of the five year plan that is put out by the Illinois Department of Transportation um, and tries to prioritize those investments. I think it's very important to have investments in our infrastructure. Uh, you know, we know how critical that infrastructure can be to a thriving economy. Uh, we see it every day as, you know, trucks and trains and and uh, planes come in and out of Illinois and bring the products that we're growing or manufacturing here to markets to be sold all around the world. That's an incredibly important part of our economy. And so, you know, while I think it's important to recognize there's a lot of different priorities in, in that, I, I think we should ask, what can we do to make sure Illinois has uh, a safe, reliable, and modern infrastructure network? Uh, I want to touch on the, the road fund. You, you just mentioned that uh, the governor had some temporary uh, tax relief built in uh, by uh, removing that escalator for the gasoline tax. Uh, House and Senate Republicans are basically asking for uh, a different approach to uh, uh, providing folks uh, a little bit more comfort at the uh, pump, so to speak. That's right. So, you know, our proposal has been to um, reduce the sales tax that's charged on gasoline. The sales tax is a percentage. You know, if we look at the motor fuel tax, it's a fixed number of cents uh, per gallon. doesn't fluctuate as the price fluctuates. Uh, but obviously, we're all paying a heck of a lot more uh, for gas at the pump right now. And as the price of gas goes up, the percentage uh, that we collect or the dollars that we collect in sales tax go up because the percentage uh, is of a higher number. So we're calling for, and there have been a number of proposals on this, to freeze that or to cap the, the sales tax that we're bringing in. And I think that's a responsible way to do it. 
to absorb that through the state's general budget and not divert dollars away from some of the infrastructure investments that we've made. Democrats, of course, are in the majority in both the House and Senate. Are, are your ideas being heard? You know, I think they're being heard by some uh, members. I've had conversations with Democrats, uh, rank and file Democrats who, you know, are looking for uh, new ideas or ways to help uh, provide some relief to Illinois families. And so, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, working with them on some of these bipartisan, bipartisan proposals. Leader Demmer, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on Illinois Lawmakers. I appreciate the time, sir. Always glad to talk. Thank you. Up next on Illinois Lawmakers, we're talking with Democratic Majority Conference Chair uh, LaToya Greenwood of East St. Louis. She represents the 114th District in the Metro East area. Uh, Representative Greenwood is also the Vice Chair of the House Elementary and Secondary Education Appropriations Committee. Great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for inviting me this morning. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's kind of start at the at the beginning. Uh, budget negotiations are moving forward right now in the last couple of weeks of the uh, scheduled spring session of the General Assembly. How are things playing out for Governor Pritzker's education uh, funding proposal, especially as it uh, plays out for uh, K through 12 education? Well, thank you so much for that question. So as you know, um, in our state, uh, improving education in Illinois always starts with creating equity. And Governor Prisker has introduced a budget that uh, addresses all of those issues by focusing on comprehensive um, measures to impact all of the students, no one is being left behind in his budget, um, all of the students across the state of Illinois. And we know that we have some excellent schools in our state, but many underserved communities do not have access to safe and well-funded schools. And so I believe that the governor is doing his best to try to address those issues in the budget as well as members of the General Assembly with various pieces of legislation as well. Uh, as we kind of drill down into the governor's uh, proposal, he's looking at uh, roughly $9.7 billion uh, for pre-K through uh, grade 12 education. That's about uh, something like 20% of the overall state budget of around $45 billion. Uh, and there's uh, roughly a half a million more dollars, uh, half a billion dollars, excuse me, uh, in, in this year's budget proposal. Yes, so we know um, the governor has always had a passion for early childhood education as well. We know that starting school, uh, school age children off to a great start at an early age impacts them as they move forward in the education system. Um, another area that I would like to highlight in his budget is about the CTE uh, program and then understanding vocation, the importance of vocational education as well to our students. Not all students are college bound. And so we as a state have to start to provide the access and the necessary resources to um, address those students who just want to uh, learn a trade and get a well-paying job in the trades because they do exist. And so creating opportunities, again, for all students across Illinois, regardless of your zip code. And I believe that's one of the things that Governor Pritzker has been dedicated to and the members of the General Assembly as well. Um, you mentioned early childhood uh, education. Looks like there's something uh, around $54 million more there to extend early childhood education services to uh, another 7,000 students. So that's critical in getting kids off to a good start. Absolutely. And I would like to uh, do a shameless plug. So outside of uh, the CPS, Chicago Public Schools, the East St. Louis School District receives a large early childhood uh, funding grant that has been amazing for the, the children over at the Vivian Adams Early Childhood Center in East St. Louis. It is a full day program 
and it really does prepare the students moving forward in their educational uh, future. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another $96 million or so uh, for transportation um, funding and for special education funding for uh, Illinois kids. Again, the budget is making sure that we leave no child behind. Um, the transportation issue is something that I know very well. Um, one of the first bills that I passed as a legislator had to do with providing transportation for all of the students that were in East St. Louis um, because of the high crime and other issues. Uh, it was difficult for students to get to school. So now all of those students in the community of East St. Louis can receive free transportation. Anything with providing access and equity to a child's education, we should always continue to explore and support. And the issue with special education, again, is about having equity for all students um, at whatever um, stage that they're in um, within the educational system. And so, um, to make sure that we have the necessary resources for those families and the students as well. Um, there's another $350 million this year uh, for the evidence-based funding formula for K through 12 schools. Uh, this is a way of kind of uh, leveling the playing field between uh, the uh, richer districts, if you will, and the poor districts. And uh, we're making that payment again this year. Uh, we're all, two or three years into this new uh, education reform, uh, funding reform uh, measure. How's that working uh, out for schools in your district? It's working very well. Um, you know, East St. Louis School District is one of two school districts that are under state oversight. And so it's East St. Louis and North Chicago School District. And um, this funding formula, again, has created uh, equity in that regardless of where you live, your zip code, that you should be receiving the same amount of programming and resources that other school districts. Um, and I'll just say, for instance, Edwardsville is a, is a well-funded uh, school district that is around my um, district, Representative Stewart is the uh, representative there. But um, just to have the same amount of funding and resources per child is very important in lifting people up because uh, for years and for decades, some of these communities uh, like East St. Louis have been just not invested in and it shows in the education system which will then affect the social structure, the and everything, the health, the social structure, everything else is connected to education. Oh, no doubt about it. There's there's another issue, of course, that's uh, uh, a, a major one, and that has to do with the shortage of teachers. We're down thousands of uh, empty positions across the state uh, in terms of classroom uh, teachers being able to. Uh, uh, work with kids. Uh, what are some of the ideas uh, floating around uh, at the Capitol uh, these days about trying to get more teachers uh, back on the payroll? So I know various legislators have uh, legislation that attempts to address that. But I also know that the Illinois Student Assistant Assistance Commission has numerous programs right now that will focus on improving the teacher pipeline. And we are, they will receive additional dollars as well to help implement some of these things. We have the Minority Teacher uh, Program of Illinois, that's a scholarship program. Um, um, and I think it's distributed through ISBE. We have the Golden Apple Scholars uh, of Illinois program. And we have a early childhood access consortium for equity scholarship program as well for teachers or individuals that's interested in the teaching profession. Then you have programs like the Grow Your Own Teacher Program 
which will receive funding as well. I know East St. Louis School District is uh, planning on uh, applying for that grant to assist with um, creating a pipeline from individuals already in the community, possibly parents, paraprofessionals who already have some kind of connection to the students. We think that's important as well, being connected and having homegrown uh, individuals come into the teaching profession. Representative Greenwood, thank you so much for your time this morning on Illinois Lawmakers. We certainly appreciate it. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me.